Uh, South yeah. County EMS on um, April 19th. 18th? 18th. 18th. At 6.03? 603. Cool. I left all my time pieces up in the truck. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, last month's minutes. Can we have a vote of the two months ago? Oh, yeah, minutes? two months ago, right? The February 26th meeting. I'll make a motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we Sorry. have the uh, Zach report. The Zach report, short and sweet. Um, not much going on. As I say, we're in the middle of budget season. But um, since the last meeting, um, what has happened? Bay State Health down in Springfield. Um, Currently, I, we've been talking about radio problems, radio issues. Right now, Holyoke, Mercy Medical Center, Springfield, Wing, Noble, all those, if you bring a patient down to one of those hospitals, you radio in to, it's called CMED, Central Medical Dispatch. And over the radio, you say, I need a priority, whatever, to Bay State. And they say, okay, go to this channel. And you wait in line. You're literally just listening to the radio, waiting for a break, trying to get your word in. Um, and then you give your radio report, and that's that. Bay State Medical Center, because they're a stroke center, a trauma center, a pediatric center, STEMI center, all these things, they're rolling out. It's actually two-way medical transmission stuff. So now on our laptops, we were selected along with West Springfield Fire and AMR um, as a trial run before they roll it out to everybody. And on our laptops now we have a computer program that can wirelessly communicate securely with Bay State. So instead of waiting online for the radio and giving a report, we actually put in the patient demographics, enter in a quick narrative vital signs and we hit send and whenever it can get that message in it goes digitally and then it pops up down at Bay State. Wow, that's wonderful. It pops up on the computer who, of the person who normally answers the radio, it automatically sorts and prioritizes, so the most important ones go to the top, and if it's something like a trauma, they click on it and hit send a trauma team, and then in the hospital, their trauma team all has iPads or iPhones, they've got screens up, so it's, it's going to take a lot of the stress off of the radio system, it's going to increase communication, um, and then they can, what they can do is they can actually send a follow-up question back, and so it pops up on our end, and it's there for when the provider can get to it. So instead of sitting on the radio and waiting or having to drop what they're doing, it'll just stay there until their hands are free, then they can go over and answer the question and hit send. Uh, Zach, that's wonderful. So um, does that mean that um, they're doing specialized training with you so that you know how to operate this at all? Yeah, we've just... done some training. We were selected because of, for lack of a better term, we're a pretty high speed service. Um, we can, we're familiar with technology, we can handle a lot of these things, and they wanted a more rural service further out to test the system and, and those types of things. They've got their local AMR and stuff like that for volume for everyday stuff. Um, so we're rolling it out now, kind of small scale. If it works the way that everybody expects it to work, it'll then be pushed out to everybody. I've been going to meetings communicating with them about, you know, well, can we do it with Franklin as well? You know getting used to it, using it more often. There's a big cost associated with it on their end. So they would love to, you know, roll it out to Franklin as well. They've got to crunch the numbers on it. And they've told me Cooley is waiting to see how well it works and if it works well, they'd like to jump on as well. But it's a totally different corporation, so I don't know what will happen there. Um, but so that's, have you used it in real time? Or? Uh, we've we, it hasn't gone live yet for real patients, okay. um, and we may get an opportunity like once or twice to use it, just because we don't go down there that often sure. for uh, specific types of calls. So um, we'll see. We have used it in training. We've played around with it a little bit, um, and it's it looks very much like the patient care software we already use. You open it up, you put in some demographics, and you hit send, and that's um, that how it goes. Um, they also do, part of the program is, it's all GPS tracked, so they can do, it's called a geofence. So if the, the trauma team is waiting for our arrival, we can hit send up here, we're not going to be there 
for who knows how long, but once we cross over some imaginary line in space, like across the Connecticut River or something down in West Springfield, then on their end it shoots an alert up and they say, hey, the ambulance is 10 minutes out. And so they know that in real time. We don't have to call back or give them updates or things like that. So that's very cool. Yeah. Um, along with that, there's a new standard for um, medical reporting. There's this thing nationally, it rolled out a number of years ago, but the federal government wants to collect data about emergencies, medical emergencies pre-hospital, just so we know where to spend our grant money. And part of that is collecting more and more data anonymously and starting this year, the next level, even more data is being collected. It's all information we're already entering into the report, just means that it's gonna get reported now to the feds, but part of that means that we're gonna to get to upgrade our system um, to a better patient care reporting software. So it's the vendor we currently use, um, and they have a updated system, just like when you get a software update on your computer or your phone. We're gonna get that, it's free of charge, um, and that will have increased reporting ability and CQI, continuous quality improvement um, ability on our end. So we're gonna see a benefit from our own internal tracking, the feds will see a benefit, and part of making that system work and also this base data initiative is we've added um, wireless data to the three ambulances so before we had department cell phones in case we needed to call um, the doctor on call everybody has their personal cell phones now and going back through the records nobody's using these cell phones so instead of maintaining the cell phone we're transitioning those plans just to a data plan for the mobile hotspot. It's cheaper per month, um, and it allows us to have that communication in real time for retrieving medical records and sending stuff out. So that's very exciting. Um, and that basically brings us up to modern technology, what the police have been using for a very long time now, having that, that mobile data in their police cars. So. Are you speaking of that? Are you are you already on the system? Because um, like if you go to uh, the way it works, um, if you go to a address for you know call, all the calls, all the stuff is supposed to pop up, whether it was police, board of health, fire, you know, so that you yeah. have some warning what you're walking into. You're talking about the IMC CAD system at Shelburne Control. Yeah. Um, the short answer is I don't know. The long answer is the police was the main kind of integration that they were working on. All of the area departments, I believe, that are going to integrate have done so. Yes, the guess. next stage is the fire department side. Oh, and then you guys. And then EMS. And I don't even know whether the fire department stuff is really going to happen or not. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. The... The reason police was so easy was because they were using the same computer systems and it was just a matter of sharing the same database. So flipping that switch was very easy for them. I know the fire departments, they use different company software and getting it to talk and I don't know what will happen on the EMS side. Our patient care reporting software, one of the reasons we selected them is because they are able to integrate with the system Shell Control uses. So we are in a position to use it if it ever happens, I don't know if it will. Well, you know what? We have a children oversight meeting um, the first week of May, so I'll try to get you the... I'll find out. I'll follow up on Yeah, that. and we have representation on the oversight, I know. you know, and, and all that stuff, so... Um, you know, yeah, we... but that doesn't mean that it translates unless someone's pushing it. Right, correct. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to push it. If you hear something, yeah. yeah. Okay. Outreach, uh, it's elementary school, um, career day, science festival, time of the year. We just did Sunderland. We're doing Deerfield Elementary coming up. Um, and this takes kind of different levels. We've been doing it for a number of years now. We're we'll repeat customers of theirs. In the Sunderland side, they do an internal kind of career day thing and we just park the ambulance on the outside and the kids can visit and drop in with their parents as they, as they want. Deerfield Elementary, we actually do presentations for different age groups, different grade groups. So we'll do like fourth grade and then we'll do fifth grade and they can come and see the ambulance and see our equipment. Um, and those are good because part of it is, this is a career you might want. And the other part of it is, we're friendly and this is what you might want to expect and let's, 
let's answer your questions about medical emergencies before one's actually happening. So, yeah, we, uh, we really enjoy that. Um, and it's always a rush for people to sign up to take those details. So that's good. That's really nice. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, and then administration, I've presented the budget to all three member towns, uh, the respective finance committees, and then the select board members um, that were present. And everybody's very happy with the service they're receiving. They're very happy with how the budget looks. Uh, the ongoing questions about kind of, you know, I, I heard about write-offs. What does that mean? Um, and just kind of explaining, you know, allowable billing and, and how legally we can't bill for some things and just write-offs is kind of the inevitable conclusion in emergency response and, and medical stuff. And, and everybody I seem to have gotten all their questions answered and is very happy and uh, I'm looking forward to, I will be present at all three town meetings if any questions come up from the crowd, but um, I haven't heard any sort of pressing only, issues or the anything. The only thing, um, I guess, um, I, I would like you just to start tracking a little bit maybe, um, is um, our demographics in all three towns is that we're all aging. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I think one of the outcomes is we're going to have more service requirements. So we need to do that. But what's really important is, you know, what do we have as a percentage of private insurance versus Medicare? Because part of this write-off is that it's a, you know, whatever it costs, $750 to get an ambulance out is what you bill to a private insurance and then you know Medicare only gives you half of that so right. the write-off is the difference between the Medicare allowance and what we <coughs> originally charge so it's not really a write-off it's just that that's what we're gonna get reimbursed but from a long-term health of our organization one of the things that made us like Matt and I from way back we, we had a good percentage of private insurance, right? mm -hmm. and I just kind of, if, if there was a way to track it, I just would like to know if trending from a financial health of our organization yeah. and the independence of our organization, and also that would also help us decide if, it, if we do expand at all, what, what we would expect in the expansion you know, or what we could afford to risk or whatever. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It would just be nice to trend it. Yeah, absolutely. All the all that data about numbers of insured and types of insured and total numbers are included in the activity tracking reports um, that I did send out to the BOO. So all the data is there, but, you know, kind of graphing it. Yeah, we can, yeah, can, we can certainly do that. Do that. Uh, um, um, yeah. Some of the other attachments. Yeah, and it's... Yeah. Sex email. The, you know, we're... Let's see, for FY18, because that was the full year, we had 746 transports. 701 of them were insured privately, and 45 were insured or were uninsured or um, self pay otherwise. So, you know, very small percentages there. And that can't be, that can't be true. I, you can, I, the, it's sideways here. Um, yeah, but that can't. We can't have such a high percentage of private insurance. Oh, so, oh yeah. Sorry. So yeah, Medicaid. Okay. Oh yeah, it's all right there. Yeah, okay. you're you're absolutely Medicaid, right. So Medicaid, seven hundred and one okay. insured patients of that Medicaid yeah, Medicare okay. counted for over four hundred. But yeah, okay. yeah, it's all there. Yeah. Okay. So what we need to do is probably it would just be nice to keep a graph. Yeah. And right. Just see where we're trending. And I think I heard or read recently that the average age will be increasing at least until 2050, yeah, I think. So. Well, well, yeah, but we're gonna ha we'll have we the 2020 it. census relatively, yeah. you know, by 2021. So, so we'll have, we'll see how accurate that is versus what the projections were, because um, they're projecting us all to have much a uh, huge increase in our elderly population, yeah. or over 65 population. But we don't know if that's really going to hold true. So we'll see what the census says, and then we'll look at our trending. And that should set us up so that we make good decisions on what some of the financial decisions would be for... Well, yeah. we've got a full-time term of insurance, so we're keeping people alive longer. 
Well, we're going to be busier, but yes. but what what are we going to generate for revenue? I mean, we, we need to be able to um, forecast the revenue yeah. a little bit more accurately, and you know that kind of. I mean, it's just just a statistical thing. To keep. I mean, no one knows what goes on really, but. Um, if we have a little bit of trending information that will help us make some long-term decisions, maybe. I think financially, though, we're doing very well, so um, I'm not really worried. But we just have to make sure that we don't get such a mix of Medicare that then we need to look at what we're doing, maybe, at yeah. that point. And uh, wrapping up the financial stuff um, and following up on the conversations that we've had previously. So there's two things that I put in this administration. One is um, currently we, our options when Comstar gives us the reconciliation report is write off and or um, report to a credit bureau that it's being written off. And our uh, collections policy that we enacted recently outlines when we would choose one or both of those options. The third thing that our policy allows for and outlines a method for is sending to a collections agency. Um, and we currently don't have any sort of agreement or affiliation with a collections agency. So I talked to Comstar about that. One of the reasons that we've been very happy with them and selected them to begin with is because they do have a relationship kind of in-house. And I included a copy of their affiliation agreement contract um, for review. It's First Financial Resources, it's, it's a separate company, um, and they are affiliated with Comstar so that everything is still reported and handled through Comstar. So instead of us having to peel off these accounts and move them over and reconcile two different pages, anything that um, FFR, First Financial Resources, receives or anything like that, they report back to Comstar, and then when we get our monthly reports from Comstar and they go to Brenda and to me, that's all included together. All the payments are made to Comstar. Comstar makes all of the deposits directly into our account from them. Um, they've had a long relationship together. It's the type of thing where um, nothing would go to FFR unless we, per our policy specifically, line by line, say this, this account we want to go to FFR. Um, and then their terms are they would collect uh, 33 and a third percent of whatever, th that's their share, and then they deposit um, the net difference. So we don't get separately billed by FFR or anything like that. They, if they collect $100, they then give us $66, and, and that's the end of it. So that is the affiliation agreement um, with them. And that, are, that means that we actually lower our normal receipt costs? Uh, no, this that shouldn't. Uh, oh, that, that, so that's something different. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so this was, you know, my recommendation. So you don't have to do both to do it. No, 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 no. These, these are totally separate things. Um, so this is, you know, my recommendation is this isn't going to cost any additional money. Okay. If anything, it would be a means for us to collect more money, that, that small percentage that we would send to collections. Um, and I just don't know. I, I, I don't see a downside um, to this. I just don't know who's authorized to sign that or people, enter into that. When they get into collections, some people hear 33% is what the company keeps and think, oh my God, they're keeping a third of it, you know. What they don't understand is what that entails is they're going to make multiple phone calls. They're going to look for any way possible to try to recoup that money being, so if it's, intensive. sure, if it's small claims, if it's attaching to wages, garnishments, whatever mm -hmm. they need to do. And all that, like you said, is very labor intensive for somebody to do. To hire somebody to do that, and maybe they have some success, maybe they don't, it's another body on payroll that you need to worry about. Right. In this way, we don't pay anything, we just get two-thirds of whatever they're able to collect after we've exhausted right. every other means possible before we get there. And, and this is... We, this, we gain from it. Yeah, this is money we wouldn't have collected, period. You know, this, these are just accounts that 
the person is gone. Or... And they're willing to go out of state because a lot of our ones that aren't collectible are like from 91 kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're willing to do that. Right? Yeah, I quite, I, I honestly haven't dug deep into this. I, I included it so people could look at it. And again, I don't know who's the authorized person to sign this. It seemed more a town of Deerfield financial kind of agreement. Um, so. Well, what we can do is um, have the Board of Selectmen we can put it on our agenda the next meeting to approve it. Yeah. Okay. Is that, would sure. that be all right, Kim? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then, segueing with this, I was actually, I, I like Comstar a lot, I keep saying that. Um, I was on the phone with our account person for an unrelated matter, um, and I said, hey, and by the way, our percentage, what, what's, the, what's the deal with that? You know, is it, our call volume has gone up considerably over the years, you know, is there any? And she's like, oh, you know, like, I'm not authorized, but let me, let me check with the president. Um, we currently um, pay 6.5% to Comstar. They send us a bill for, for any money that we collect, they send us a bill for 6.5% of that. Um, so I said, yeah, just check into it for me. Um, and she came back uh, within a half an hour and said, yeah, Rick Martin, the president, said um, we can do 4%, no problem. Here's a new contract for 4%. Um, and I was like, oh, all right. Um, I included that contract. Right now we are on a year to year. Um, we signed a three-year contract many years ago and we've just been on a year to year. This would be a new three-year contract at the 4% with year to year after that. Um, this to me seems like a no-brainer. No -brainer. Um, again, a town of Deerfield financial thing, so. Um, do you um, have let me have I've that. got copies of both, even uh, electronically. So no, okay, so I'm just going to take those. We'll we'll put it on the next agenda, yeah. so we can switch over. Yeah. Diane. Yeah. Tomorrow or Monday. Oh, or are you are you going to go in tomorrow? To the town hall. I, I will, but I'm not. I didn't know. Yes. Oh. To answer your question. <laughs> I guess I was actually. Right. Right. No, I was, I was processing I the way she said that, to... like I was supposed to be there for something else, no, and I was no. like, I could see the no. wheels spinning. Well, I'm like, what, what meeting am I missing? Yeah. No, 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 okay. no, no. I was not going in tomorrow. We paint the Easter eggs and my hide stuff. No, no, no. I got to cook tomorrow. So listen, that would appreciate okay. if you could no, drop that off to Diana and tell her to put it on the agenda. Both of them. Okay. And we'll just take care of it because it makes that's just total financial sense. Yeah. Just, yeah, and uh, that's it for me. That's my director's report. That's everything I had on okay. the. Um, the only thing I was, I was just curious why there was such a. I mean, it, was there anything unusual that happened in Deerfield this past year? We had a big jump in number of transports. Uh. Seven hundred seventy-four. That's huge. Oh, for, for twenty eighteen. Yeah, we went from six twenty to seven. 74. It's just, that's quite a lot. Well, we've gone from 700 to, oh, sorry. Go down lower. So 594 in 2015, 702 in 2016, 715 in 2017, 774 in 2018. But I mean, that's our, that's our 10 to 13% increase every year in calls. I mean, that's. Oh, isn't that? 620 for Deerfield, Duncan. Right. Oh! Yes. You're talking seven, about the trip. Oh, total transports. Yo, yeah. right. Sorry. This beard is doing weird things to my brain. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. We went, we went, yeah, but see, we went from 50... 552. To 620. Right. Yeah. yeah. In Deerfield. And, and, and uh, we start, you know, a couple of years ago, we were 491. And then 490. You know, yeah. 429. Um, and then it's so the old adage, things. we build it and they will I, come. That's mm -hmm. a lot of it. Yep. I think so. Abs, 100%. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Okay. Uh, there are, word gets out that they're going to get Cracker Jack paramedics within a few minutes. Why would you do anything but call 911? Yeah. Um, no, uh, that's, let's go with that. I, I, just, yeah. I just didn't know, I didn't know if you... Oh, you get the brush. You know, and there's... Uh, what is it? Uh, the famous adage, there's three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, so when you're looking at these numbers, it, so, some things look like they stand out. I don't know why that number is. nothing. It may be something. Okay. It may not be something. Okay. It might have been, you know, one large group that came through Yankee Candle or something. And, 
We could go up like 10% or more. So. At least 10%. Yeah. I think it was 13% well, from that's last what, year. Actually, and we did predict that yeah. this was going to happen. Um, so at what point, so now for 2018, you're at 1194. And wasn't it around 13 or 14 when you, 100 when you got up to there, you had to put on another ambulance more? Wasn't that what we were talking about years ago? It was an average about three runs a day, three and a half runs a day. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know. yeah. I, so we're not quite there yet. No, I, no, we're not. Okay. I, 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 I would. Just want to make sure we're kind of watching. That. Yeah, we're not there. It definitely. I, you can feel it. I, we're, we're getting a little bit busier. You know, every week, every day. I think it's inevitable that we're going to have to figure out what our next move is. Um, so I think we should prepare ourselves mentally for that discussion down the road. Yeah, um, but not yet. Yeah, no, I think, right. yeah. No, that's yeah. all right. I think the, the more important statistic to begin looking at is when, how often are you getting calls while you're already Multiple out on calls. a call that we're missing? Yeah. That we can't, yeah. we can't handle ourselves on call mutual aid. When that yeah. number starts to climb, that's when. I'm really happy to see that it seems like we're still to settle down then with AMR or whatever they are. Yes. Yeah. There are there are two factors at play. One is AMR is finding their sea legs, um, and and the other one is we're digging our heels in a little bit more about, you know, we're we're not going to be subsidizing them, and and this is these are the situations in which we are available, and it's not always. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, in Thank doing you, so, yeah. it's not violating terms of any mutual aid. It's more of a nope. an expectation. We'll call when we're available. That that is if it is if it is mutual aid. If there is no ambulance transporting ambulance en route to that patient, and we have a crew and an ambulance, we will respond. That person needs an ambulance. They need to be able to go to the hospital. If it is an intercept, if that patient already has an ambulance en route to render them care and bring them to the hospital, and we don't have an additional crew on, if, if we were to respond and it would leave us without anything, then we say we are not available. We don't have the minimum staffing needed to okay. provide a second ambulance and still be available for our, sure. our three communities. And that, that's very typical. Northampton operates the same way, Amherst operates the same way. We have a minimum staffing that we want to maintain for our own towns. Okay. Zach, I have a question. The other day there was an, a bad accident at the intersection down the road and I saw an AMR ambulance. Was they just happened to be passing by or was it they called in because we needed I, I could I could look up that specific instance. Um, it could be that. It might be, you know, we well, have... Well, you, you did respond. So you, I saw that you had responded. Were we there? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. You were there. I, it might be sometimes, you know, multiple patients. Right. We have one, we guarantee one truck on 24-7. We try to add staff during the day. That's our per diems. I'm not going to pay overtime, you know, for that, for that shift. So if we don't have that full second crew and we have two patients at once that we can't transport one ambulance, then we call mutual aid. Sure. Um, and depending on where the call is, uh, usually it's AMR Greenfield that is our first call. Uh, Hatfield, Conway, love them to death, um, but usually what happens is it's faster because they're staffed to request them right away. They'll be on scene before Conway can come down the hill or something like sure. that. So um, it was probably a, a case of multiple patients yeah. uh, at the one car I accident. Think it was. No, three cars in the accident. So. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, that sounds, that sounds typical. I think what I read in the paper, there were at least three that were transported, and so you needed a second truck anyhow. Yeah, you know, I, we can do two stable <laughs> patients in the back of a truck, but as soon as somebody's requiring at least a little bit of attention, mm -hmm. we like to just, one patient per truck, we don't like to divide our focus or anything like that, so, yeah. Any new updates on the state and rolling out their uh, new programs, visiting? So, uh... You are talking about community EMS, mobile yeah. integrated healthcare, and mobile integrated healthcare with ER diversion. Uh, the first community EMS, we that is a separate license that we have to apply for. It is free of charge. We have to actually have the select board board of health to co-sign on it. Um, we are already doing things in the community that qualify us for that. So what and do we so have to do? it's just a matter of us getting the paperwork okay. together. 
Um, right. and, and we'll be able to put this stamp what on it. What did you call it? That's community EMS. Okay. Um, the, and that, those are the things that we're doing right now, which is the elementary school. You know, like education, that counts. The stop the bleed. The stop the bleed training counts. Our fall risk assessments that we do for patients, those count. These are all things that we're already doing. Senior this, about the senior center. Senior center, absolutely. Okay. The, so the, now there's a name to it, um, and and we can. Well, that's easy stamp that. because we want you to do that. It's too. very easy. Yeah, absolutely. The 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 next levels are yeah. So it's it's the type of thing where we're already doing these things right now. It's not we just. And, and so that's called community EMS. Community EMS. That, and that's yes. a designation? Yes. So the idea being that we are, we are a public health entity. We should be doing a lot more for our communities than just waiting to respond when somebody has an emergency. And, um, well, that's no problem. It's no problem. We're already doing it. Um, right. so, um, it so then what's the other one? So the other one is called Mobile Integrated Health Care, MIH. And this is where they're trying to get EMS services to do the doctor house call type thing. So well, we were talking about that. So we were talking about that. Let's yeah. talk about how the dust settled on that. Um, we moved in other parts of the country already and doing it well. Doing it well. Um, the, the idea is if you go and somebody's had the flu for two weeks, why would we automatically just transport them to the emergency department? Would they be better served by making an appointment with them at the community health center tomorrow, or type thing, you know, and and, and well, doing we that type of stuff? Well, we were talking about follow up, like if someone post op follow up, because now when you yes. go to the hospital, they get you through and chuck you home, right. and there's no, right. and a lot of times if you don't have an advocate and you're older, it's so confusing. And people, so I mean, we're going through this with my parents. Zach's been on a few of those calls. Yeah. Yes. So the way that this has to work is that the EMS service service has to be associated with a physician somewhere a doctor that can sign off on on what is happening in the field those follow-ups things working right now we have an affiliation with a doctor that allows us to provide emergency care and transport to an emergency department so if you Which need doctor is this? Dr. Benson? Uh, Wook Beltran out oh. of Bay State oh, okay. um, in order for us to do these other services, you need to sign on with a doctor. And the state said, or basically said with their actions, is that they want to make sure that the services that are taking this on are capable of doing it financially, have the backing of a hospital or you know related physician service, um, and are committed to doing it. And the way that they're determining that is the I think it's seventeen thousand dollars a year is the license just to provide this service because they expect what will happen is the Bay State Health will pay that out of money they found in the couch cushions because what it means for them is it keeps those repeat patients out of their emergency department, which would be more expensive for them to treat. Um, with the way of so it doesn't, doesn't look good when they come back either. Well, the thing is, because right now under the Affordable Care Act, if if you're seeing, say you're dis, you go to the hospital for knee surgery, and then you go home, and then you have a complication from it. If you go back to the emergency department under the Affordable Care Act, that the hospital can't bill for that. They're responsible for your well-being okay. and so it's no it it makes sense because it's it's an incentive for the hospital to take care of their patients because before you came back in through the ed door they're like great you get to bill you again yeah. um but so the ambulance service would be able to bill correct um so the idea with mobile integrated health care is they want the it's cheaper for a hospital to provide the MIH service in the community than to see those patients again. So they're expecting the hospital to foot the bill. The other thing too is that the Department of Public Health, this is a huge system that they don't have any staffing. So they're expecting that these handful of licenses throughout the state will help pay for the staff at the Department of Public Health to manage these programs. Well, um, if the state sent all the money to the Department of Public Health that they deserve from all the EMT fees, 
it wouldn't be an issue. But the problem is EMTs pay their fees and the state takes most of it away. I don't it's disagree. Ridiculous amount of fees. Yes. So when this ruling came down, this is part of the reason why Medicare left Greenfield in favor of AMR. Medicare is, their parent company is MediV in Canada. They do community EMS. That, that is their bread and butter. And so they saw it coming in Massachusetts and they're going, great, we already have experience doing this. Once, once that shoe drops, we'll be golden. And then when they saw what the Department of Public Health said, this is the license, this is where it needs to come from, stuff like that, MediV said, oh, this is, this is hospital-based, this isn't something that we're going to really be able to do. And that's when MediV left and sold to AMR. Bay State Health System crunched the numbers, and they are going to be offering mobile integrated health care through another private company. So they, are, they have a division in Springfield. They are advertising currently to the patients that Bay State is responsible for down in the Springfield market, and it's going to trickle up to Franklin County, and, and that, that's how it's rolling out. So these services will be available eventually, hopefully, in rural Franklin County to our constituents, um, but we should not expect mobile integrated health care to come out of South County EMS, AMR, Greenfield Fire, Turns Falls Fire, it's, it's cost prohibitive and we wouldn't have the backing of our affiliate hospital to do it. They would have to sign on to the license with us and they've already figured out how to provide the service um, without us. Uh, uh, the company, if you're wondering, is called Dispatch Health. Dispatch Health, they're out of the south and the idea is just as now your health insurance company, if you have an emergency, they want you to call their hotline first and then they, okay, you go. Basically, the way it works is you call Dispatch Health. You say, I've had a cold for two weeks. What would you like? And they say, oh, we'll send out a nurse and a paramedic in a Ford Escape. They'll be there in the, you know, the next 40 minutes and they'll come by and they have their they have their licenses and their doctors on call and all that, and, and that's how they handle it. And if it is a true medical emergency, it'll get screened either at that initial call or when they arrive on scene, and then they call 911. So if they're, we won't know if they're visiting a patient in Deerfield or Sunderland or Waitley, but if that patient is having a medical emergency, we will get dispatched. We get that call. It doesn't go to anybody else. No, there's no backdooring like that. We are we are responsible for our service area. So that's that going to be a big learning curve. Yeah. How is that different from visiting nurse? Um, that this is on call and available to somebody who hasn't already set up a relationship with the visiting nurse association. So. You would, I think they're going to find that they want to spend that seventeen thousand dollars per agency. You know, we will. <laughs> and they're going to find out that this is not going to work because you're talking about having on staff people. Whereas if they paid the seventeen, this, they could have you guys be doing this. I and we were just we just had a presentation by Lisa White on the um, you know that aging community stuff, and I could see us doing something like this as part of that. Um, follow up of that, you know, um, yeah, you know, grant process. So, just keep an eye on it. Oh, absolutely. Because absolutely. I think there's going to be an opening for us in a couple of years. Th there's still a lot that we can do on the community EMS side. Yeah. We, what we aren't able to do without the mobile integrated health license is we aren't allowed to tell somebody we won't take them to the emergency room. Under the MIH, somebody could say, I have a cold, I want to go to the ED. And under MIH, you can say, this, isn't, this doesn't warrant an emergency department run. We're not going to take you. That's really the carrot on that. Um, we will still be required by regulation if we show up and they say, I want to go to the emergency department. Okay, like that's, I have to take you if you want to go and that's the only place I can. Um, but we are not... Um, we are not cut off. There, there are a lot of initiatives we can still do under community EMS, a lot of things that as an advocate for public health we are able to do, um, and I don't want people to get discouraged 
you know, no, find but this other one thing. of the things, like I said, one of the things we had always talked about is just you know doing follow up when people come home from the hospital yeah. and stuff like that. So I'm actually pretty excited about this because I don't think what they're setting up is going to be fiscally responsible. Yeah. For them, I mean, they they'll try it. It's going to cost them a lot more money. There's there's a lot about pay. private health care. I don't understand how anybody can make it fiscally, know. you know, so, responsible. But um, but having yeah. you in the community and knowing the community and for seventeen thousand, that would be a, a huge. To me, yeah. it's a bargain. Yeah, you know, and to really to launch something like that, I mean, part of it is you know, with that buy-in, they want to know that you have the staff behind it, you have the equipment behind it. I mean, there would be. That license only costs seventeen thousand dollars, but we'd have to add staff. We'd have to add equipment. We'd have to add training. You know, like there's a lot of costs associated with that. That is a that is a large. It is. Ask, but um, that is also like the next level. And that yes. Will help us afford the next level. So just keep an eye. Yeah, on. it's the next level too, because what it does is it gives your backup crew during the day mm -hmm. ways to be out in the community, taking right. care of patients. And producing the additional, revenue. Yeah, the revenue helps. But, you know, and, and I said that, I'm sitting here weighing out the continuity of care. It's great when our folks get to know the people who have had or have medical conditions. So when you get called, you've got all that data and you know what you're walking into. And, and you've got a baseline. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can understand the hospital wanting it because they've got the data on their end and they want the baseline and they want the information as well. Speaking of the revenue thing um, and related to this, Medicare, federal government, just announced within the last four weeks a reimbursement model for community EMS in Medicare, which is groundbreaking. They, they are acknowledging that this is where the future is going and that right now we can only bill and collect money if we take somebody to the hospital. If we stay on scene with them for an hour, you know, bandage a wound, whatever, and then leave and don't transport them, we can't bill for that. Medicare is saying there should be a means for that. You, you've provided a service, you should be able to bill Medicare for it. The catch is, my understanding, they will deny paying for patients that are taken to the emergency department if they could have been managed at home. And so oh, that's, no. but again, like that, that's, you know, carrot and stick. That's saying yeah, no. this, this patient it's is the high cost of going to the emergency. This patient, exactly, off. is better served staying at home. So that should have been the thing. So this is, they just announced it. You know, it's, it's everybody's like, we're paying attention. We're probably not going to see that type no. of thing here. We're going to have to sign some agreement. That's down the line. Yeah. Um, but it does I, mean I, we are making forward I, progress. I think you would see it after October. Because they are trying to get this in ready for the new budget year. Mm -hmm. So I, I think yeah, but then once the feds approve it, then the state's got to approve the regulations and what they look like. Because today, if the patient says, I well, want to go, it'll be next July, you've got to take them. Now it's got to yeah. change to say, if patient says, I want to go, and in your opinion, you've got a cold, you don't need to go to the ED. That's why it would make more sense for us to be doing it because yeah. chances are you're going to respond in an ambulance. Yeah. Well, and then you'd have to, you, you know, what happens if their private insurer doesn't offer that, you know, and now are we in the business of asking a patient whose insurance they have and then checking the chart to see, you know, what services are covered. Right. But there's you know. nothing you can do about that. Might, yeah. It might end up like that. Right. So. But that's okay. But I, maybe you're right. The state, I forgot the state. So maybe next July. By next we'll see. July, maybe it'll it, be okay. It's coming. And I'm excited yeah. about our healthcare getting better in this country and people getting the services that are more appropriate for them and then lowering the burden on everything yeah. else. Um, I, I just, this is part of it, so I'm really yeah. appreciative. Yeah. Yeah. The hospitals will be thrilled when the former CEO at Franklin, I had spoken to him years ago, and he said his biggest issue were people using the emergency department as a regular doctor. Yeah. There are models in Europe where the primary care doctors are treated more compensated higher than your specialty doctors in America because they're responsible for managing the health of the people who choose them as their right. primary care provider and not to keep them out of the hospital but keep them well longer to 
to avoid yeah. having to spend time in the hospital. Yeah, and some one of the terms that's we don't have health care in this country, we have sick care in this right. country. That like everything is patterned around you getting ill and then me making money from it. And and right, exactly. How do we prioritize? Oh, you don't go to the hospital, around. only sick people do. Oh yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that update. Yeah, yeah, my that's pleasure. wonderful. Thank you. I, I, I'm really excited. I think things are going along really well. So thank you. Yeah, and I will be, I will be at all, all three town meetings. I live in Deerfield, so I'll be sitting in the voter section of that town meeting. But I will be present at the others, and I think that's probably it. A little bit. I just wanted to mention that because as you, we were talking about that healthcare thing. Uh, that's what Michelle does, uh, you know, through the our insurance, uh, Hampshire Group Insurance Trust. She works closely with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and she does go out and make sure that people, you know, they eat well, they exercise well. Blue Cross Blue Shield gives them money to join gyms, uh, yeah. does gives them uh, different incentives if they lower their blood pressure. You know, they get all these things. They offer a lot of clinics, and, and they do do a, a big part of that. That, and that's yeah. offered through our insurance group. And you know, Michelle said that's one of the di most difficult things when she goes to municipalities is to get employees to get involved with that. They give those pedometers, I guess mm -hmm. they call them, and, and they get they can get different things, and they have that Healthy Me program. and So they do a lot do of... We, you know, do we have the, um, where you, if you do certain fitness goals and stuff like that, that you get, our employees get discounts, you know? I don't know if they get discounts, but they get other incentives. I know they they get um, gym memberships. They get gift cards to like Big Y and stuff like that. There are different incentives that they do roll out from time to time. Okay. I, this was a number of years ago, but I remember hearing the statistic that for every dollar you spend on prevention, mm -hmm. you save thirty dollars on the back end uh, for like responding to emergencies or like ill like chronic problems. So like. It, it makes a lot of sense for the for the insurance companies to hand out those pedometers to encourage healthy eating because well I do I do know that we we have three employees in town hall that all received that type of bonus you know uh, for doing different healthy things yeah. so good that's just in our town hall so that's good all right okay any other business to come before us those Comstar agreements. You'll I'll do it tomorrow. Okay. And we'll put it, we'll vote on them at our next meeting. Great. We'll do that Tuesday night. Yeah, we can do that Tuesday night. And um, well, she, yeah, she'll, have yeah, she'll be able to post it today. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. Um, and so that way we can start saving money right away. Yeah, let me know and I'll, you know, get them signed and I'll send them off to Comstar and we'll, it'll be, I, f I think the effective date is, you know, Get the wood Whatever the tree. next fall, March, maybe April, 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 May, June, maybe June, June, maybe June 1st, I think, maybe. Yeah. We ship it up or whatever it is. Well, we, want to, we want to get it done as soon as possible. Yeah, so she'd have start. to post it tomorrow for our. Yeah, yeah post it, sign it, I'll forward it, and then I don't know exactly the date it has to take effect on their end, but it, it'll be, be. a lot sooner. Well, sooner the better, whatever. Yeah. Because that will save us some money. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn and make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.